Okay, in this video I'm going to start talking about the inverse trig functions and specifically I'm going to talk about inverse sine, cosine, and tangent. The other ones don't show up so often so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, well, any time on those. And I'm going to make some assumptions, namely that you know a little bit about how to proceed with inverse functions in general. And if not, I'm, I'll remind you of some of those things, but I'm not going to go into great detail on all of it. So to start off with, let's just look at y equals sine x. So recall for a function to have an inverse, it has to be one to one. And what that means in terms of a graph is it passes the horizontal line test. And what that says is, it says wherever you decide to put a horizontal line, it says it can hit the graph in at most one place. Uh, if not, it's not one to one, which means it doesn't have an inverse. Well, clearly, y equals sine x fails the horizontal line test. I mean, think about the x-axis. That's going to hit the graph in infinitely many places, which means it's not one to one, which means it has no inverse. So the common technique in these cases is we just simply restrict the domain. And depending on what trig function you're working with, it'll have different restrictions. But for sine x, we're going to restrict the domain to negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. So what I've got down here is just a little graph here of y equals sine x on the interval negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. And again, notice over that interval, it does pass the horizontal line test. Okay, so this is what happens for all the trig functions. We simply restrict the domain. So what I want to do real quick is I'm going to graph the inverse sine of x. Sometimes you also see this written as arc sine of x. Okay, so the arc and the inverse mean the same thing, just different notations. Different people use different ones. I think sometimes people prefer to use arc sine because, uh, again, this negative one is not, 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 not an exponent. But people get confused and they treat it like an exponent. So I think a lot of people like this notation because then you don't even see the exponent and there's no temptation to do that. So I still prefer this notation just because it's quicker to write. But again, it's a matter of taste. But whatever you see, they're, they're, they are the exact same thing. Okay, so to get the graph, one thing. Recall if, uh, so kind of a definition of an inverse. It says f inverse of x equals y if and only if f of y equals x. So all this says, it says if one point, in this case, y comma x is on f, it says that x comma y is on the inverse function. So again, it says if you know points on one, it says switch them and you get points on the other. Okay, well, we can graph inverse sine pretty easily using this. Okay, so let's see. I had a couple points labeled. Negative pi over 2 comma negative 1 was a point on our restricted sine x graph. So that means that negative 1 comma negative pi over 2 is going to be a point on the inverse. 0, 0 was on our graph. So again, 0, 0 will be on the inverse. Likewise, it said pi over 2 comma 1 was on the graph. That means that 1 comma pi over 2 will be on our new graph. Also recall that if you have a, a 1 to 1 function, to get the graph of the inverse, you can reflect it about the line y equals x. So in this case, what's going to happen is instead of sort of bending upwards, it's going to bend down. So it'll bend that way. And then over our next interval, instead of bending downwards, it's going to bend upwards. So hey, now we've got the graph of y equals inverse sine of x. No, no problem. So again, just sort of switching out points is all we're doing. Just switching out points. And if we want to apply these, uh, these definitions, well, it says that sine inverse of x equals y 
if and only if sine of y equals x. And again, this is if this is if y is in between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. And again, we use this restriction because again, that's how we make sure that sine is a one-to-one -one function. And we also get some cancellation laws, the old cancellation laws. And those are going to be very analogous. It says that sine inverse of sine x, it says that's just going to give you back x, but only if, only if x is between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Again, that's where sine is a one-to-one -one function. Likewise, it says that sine of inverse sine of x equals x, but in this case it says x has to be between negative 1 and positive 1. Well, where does the negative 1 and positive 1 come from? It comes from the interval we just found. It's from negative 1 to positive 1. Okay, so be careful there. Um, we're going to see some examples in a different video. We're going to evaluate some uh, numerical examples where in some cases, you know, if you just think about this, you'll get the right answer. But in general, you have to be careful. If you forget these restrictions, you can absolutely get, uh, get wrong answers. And again, to remember these intervals, I just think about the graphs, okay? So it will be absolutely important, and you'll see when we get to the examples again. If you don't do this, you can certainly make a mistake. So very, very quickly, I want to talk about cosine and tangent as well. So here's the graph of cosine x. Let me get rid of this other one. Here's the graph of cosine x. And for cosine x, we're going to restrict that from 0 to pi, a different interval. Notice for cosine, it doesn't make sense. So there's my quick sketch of uh, cosine. It doesn't make sense to use negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2 like we did previously because it's still not a one-to-one -one function over that interval. So that's not the interval we use. The interval we do use is from 0 to pi because over that interval cosine of x is a one-to-one -one function. Just like before, you can plot points on uh, our restricted cosine graph. You can switch them out to get the graph of inverse cosine. And same definitions as before, um, again, with the different, uh, the different restrictions on the domains. And again, we get our equivalent cancellation laws. So uh, feel free to, to take a look at those. Exact same idea, though. All we're doing is just to get the graph switching out points and again just making note of our restricted domains when it comes to applying the cancellation laws. Lastly, the graph of tangent, we do the exact same thing. For tangent of x, we do restrict it from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Over that interval, tangent is a one-to-one -one function, right? So we can use that interval just like we did for, for sine x. Notice our vertical asymptotes turn into horizontal asymptotes on the graph of inverse tangent of x, or again, arctangent of x. And just like before, um, we've got our definition. I didn't put down the cancellation laws in this case. I did, again, emphasize um, these limits. It says, as x approaches infinity, it says arctangent approaches pi over 2. And likewise, it says as x approaches negative infinity, it says the y values on arctangent or inverse tangent approach negative pi over 2. So it says as you go to the right, the y values get close to pi over 2. As you go to the left, the y values get close to negative pi over 2. So again, all these limits tell you, they're just describing, these are describing the horizontal asymptotes. Okay, so that's kind of all there is to it. Um, just knowing the graph, restricting the domain, switching out points, and that goes a long ways towards, to me, towards the basics of inverse trig functions. So in some other videos, I'm going to start doing some examples. 
The first bunch are going to be just simply evaluating numerical examples. So this is where some of the domain stuff will come into it. Some of these will have to use right triangles to evaluate, even some trig identities. I'm going to do a couple simplifying expressions. Um, in this case, notice you know we've got variables floating around, so I'm going to come up with a slightly more uh, simplified expression for these. And lastly, I'm going to do some limit problems as well. So certainly not going to do all of these in, in one video because there's a lot of examples here, but at least I'm going to try to give you a little idea of each of these. I'm not going to solve any equations uh, utilizing inverse trig functions. Uh, I definitely already have video, videos of those floating around if that's what you need.